<coughs> it's exciting to see how much this has grown since the last meeting I attended, which was just a few months ago, I think. But last month. We would have not fit in that room with these kind of people. Okay, um, I'm going to talk today, because I get the chance to, about my research, but given the time, I'm going to give the briefest of overviews. So I had my choice. I could talk a lot about one project, or I could just give you a feel for the different things going on in my lab, so I opted to do the second one this time, because I've given a couple of in-depth talks. Uh, over the past two years here. Okay. So first, my group. Um, everybody over here is in my group. Kevin is a recent alum of my group, but he's sitting in the front row because he's post-talking at Northwestern. So I included him on the slide in case you want to talk to anyone that's done any of the work here. You can find all of them. Um, Doug is somewhere in the audience. Where are you at? Raise your hand. I didn't have this picture, but he's in the middle back next to all my other lab members. Um, really quickly, we use the rubber duck as a mascot, so that gave me a great opportunity to show that. And we have no real solid reason for that, except that it was a joke one time on somebody's poster and it stuck. Um, and that was in our second year, so there we are. So we, we put rubber ducks on things whenever we can get away with it, and so we are easily found. Okay, oh, one more thing. Emily is actually the only person in the lab that didn't come with us here, so she's still at Berkeley, but she'll probably come to do experiments here several times a year, so you may see her in the future. All right, so we don't need to really belabor the wonderful benefits of synthetic biology and all the great things that have been happening, even in the past few months, as we just covered that. So I'll skip straight to what we believe is the biggest challenge that faces everybody in this room probably they want to engineer biology and that's complexity. Uh, complexity it covers so many different uh, sort of sub issues. I'm going to focus on the particular issue of really being able to control material and information into and out of the cell and also around the cell. Um, in the case of eukaryotic cells where they have membranes to segregate different uh, cellular operations. <coughs> So this is gram-negative bacteria, and you have an inner and outer membrane you've got negative bacteria with the periplasm, and there are things that happen in the cytoplasm, of course, the majority of the cellular process is happen here. There are other things that happen in the periplasm, and still other things that you really need to happen in the extracellular space. So how is the cell keeping all of these things organized, and how can we take control of that? Because it's really important to control what's going in, what's going out, and what information is being passed if we want to reprogram cells to do something. Uh, another way to look at this is, like I said, on the inside, um, cellular organization. So to control what's going on uh, within cells, we could look at scaffolds. We don't actually study scaffolds in my lab, but that's an important way to manage or cellular organization when you start engineering them to do something else. And then, um, especially in our lab, which is very heavily microbially focused, creating organelles inside prokaryotes to enable a lot more um, strategies to be relevant in bacteria, which are so much easier to grow and use. And there are a lot of ways to do that. One of the things that we focus on is bacterial microcompartments, which are in cartoon form here. Uh, this, this cellular organization also goes beyond the interior of the cell to um, how cells relate to one another in the form of engineered communities. So I don't have the picture on the slide, but there's some really nice work showing that if you put GFP in one cell and RFP in another cell, and mix those together on a plate, and then watch what happens. They'll grow out in very particular patterns, depending on the species that you've done this in, whether it's E. coli or yeast or whatever. Um, so there's definite organization at the multicellular level in communities that we really have yet to explore, and we have no idea what effect that's having on anything that we're doing in engineering cells. So an important direction, but not one that we are currently covering in my lab. OK. So what we do do is work on these protein-based systems. So proteins that sit in the membrane, like um, this is an antibiotic resistance transporter or a protein secretion machine, and also proteins that assemble in very cool icosahedral and polyhedral structures, um, like the bacterial microcompartments, which are found in some um, gram-negative bacteria, and virus capsids, which are found through, to infect pretty much all levels of life. Some example applications that we work towards are biochemical production and biomaterial production. It's not really limited to those, but those are two really powerful ways to showcase 
what engineering these particular systems can do for you. Okay. Oh, I wanna, I wanna back up because I'm relatively new here and so you won't know my history. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. So I did my PhD at the University of Texas in a lab that does, uh, is primarily known for antibody engineering, the Georgiou lab down there in chemical engineering. I was not on an antibody engineering project. In fact, I joined the lab about a month after Matt DeLisa, who's now at Cornell, um, joined. And he ushered in the twin arginine translocation era of that lab, so it was pretty short-lived and he took it with him. But that was my PhD project. So um, that gives you an idea of my graduate work. I worked on uh, the TAT system in E. coli and how to engineer it and manipulate it to move folded proteins across the inner membrane in bacteria. So you'll see that kind of theme is still reflected in my research today. And then I did my postdoc with Chris Boyd back when he was still at UCSF as a lowly assistant professor. Um, it was a fun group, pretty much. All of the names of the different people that I worked with at that time, you would probably know because they've gone on to do really great things. And I'm actually considered, along with one other member, um, Eli Groban, we're the black sheep of the family because we haven't yet started our own successful company. <laughs> so, you know, a challenge to anyone that wants to join the group. We're really looking to start a successful company so that we aren't shunned anymore. <laughs> really Voight Lab people. Um, in the Voight Lab, my project was on secretion again, um, actually using this apparatus. So I continue to do that once we moved to Berkeley. Um, and this is called the Type 3 secretion machine, and it secretes proteins all the way out of the cell. Um, and actually into host cells, because it's part of the infection process for Salmonella and E. coli and all those bad intestinal bugs. Um, and it proved to be a really interesting system, so we, we kept going at it. So, it gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of where I came from and how I ended up here. I did one more short postdoc. It was actually a continuation of my Voight Lab work, because my side project there was engineering cellulases um, for bioenergy biofuel purposes. And uh, once I knew I was moving to Berkeley, I decided to move across the bay and um, Voight allowed me to continue my project at the Joint Bioenergy Institute in Emeryville, so the um, DOE-funded biofuel center of the time. So I also have a lot of background now in biofuels <laughs> as well. So that informed actually one of my other projects, which I'm about to talk about. Okay, so. Backing up, how nature controls the flow of materials into and out of cells. I told you there's this mem these membranes, um, inner and outer in the case of gram-negative bacteria, plasmid in the case of yeast, and so forth. Uh, these membranes are amazing. They can control the transport of electrons, ions, gases, macromolecular compounds of all shapes and sizes and features. And they even change in response to heat to help the cell survive pretty much anything that you throw at it and anything it produces is in some way controlled by this membrane. At the macromolecular scale, so for chemical engineers, we develop all sorts of different materials and membranes to cover each of these. And so this is a biological system that does it all in one. And it does that using, well, it can change the lipids slightly, so especially the heat um, is controlled mostly by the lipid composition. But the rest of it is controlled by proteins that sit in the membrane, which is great for me because I've been studying proteins that sit in the membrane for over a decade now, well over a decade. Um, okay, so these can be passive or active transporters. Um, there's a lot of detail that I'm going to skip over, but when we started working in the area of, you know, manipulating these transporters for synthetic biology purposes, we knew there was going to be three ways that we could manipulate them to make things better. We can change their specificity if they already exist in the membrane. We can change the number of them that are available and um, increase the activity rate. Maybe in some cases that turns out to be really hard to do for transporters. It's, I think similar to enzymes. It's a lot easier to change the specificity of an enzyme than its rate, although you can do both. So we, we started applying that in my lab. The first uh, projects really were on these simple machines, the antibiotic resistance transporters. And this is part of a biofuels um, direction that we went. So you have, in a biofuels process, you have sugars from the breakdown of plant cell walls and such coming into the cell being converted to a biofuel and then um, 
hopefully have that biofuel go out because it turns out that most of the things we want to make are not so good for the cell's survival. So we're going to use the transporter to secrete the toxic products, so increasing the yield of products that we can make. We use the antibiotic resistance pumps because those were already in E. coli, they already acted on a bunch of useful and similar molecules, although not alcohols, which happened to be biofuel of choice at the time. And we knew enough about them to know that we wanted to manipulate the protein shown in blue, which is called ACRB, because that's where specificity was determined. Okay, so I, um, I'm skipping like, all of the work. I just want to give you a flavor. We did directed evolution. Um, we found mutants. They're actually single point mutations that did enable that transporter to work on butanol and actually many alcohols when previously it had no activity nor did any of its homologs that we were able to test. We and others were able to test. And when we, so that was just for tolerance though, right, that, that we did all that screen and then when we put those variants in a strain that actually was making butanol, so the butanol was coming from the inside rather than being added to the outside, it uh, even in that case benefited productivity by about 40%. And so that's called variant two on this plot, and this is just butanol concentration. And that wasn't um, that was great. Um, there's a lot more to do, but that wasn't all that we did on this project because we noticed that membrane proteins tend to not do so well in the cell when you try to make a lot of them. And so perhaps the biggest impact of this work will not be proving that you can engineer membrane protein, but the the side effect that we noticed that it was so hard to make them and to do this project. One of my students spent his whole PhD developing systems for um, dynamically controlling the amount of protein there to get the most out that we could possibly do given the constraints of the cell. And um, so one outcome is this PGNTK promoter um, that we put in front of our great variant of the pump. And without any optimization, it did as well as variant two under conditions that I'm going to be really honest, took us about six months to get so that we could see the difference between variant two being induced and not induced um, for productivity. So uh, this promoter is probably the most uh, relevant to many of you. Anyone that's working with something that might cause membrane stress should reach out to me. It, it works on every single membrane stressing um, protein production that we've tried and also some collaborators. So does it use um, some sort of like cell regulation of the stress response? We need to figure it out, so that's an, on, um, I would say ongoing that the student graduated and nobody else has joined yet, so potential project idea. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, we, it's a the gluconate kinase operon, and so it's probably controlling that particular transporter, but we want to know the exact, like, what um, transcription, what's involved in that mechanism, and we have guesses, but I don't have absolute confirmation yet, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, it would be interesting to see that and see how much we can tune it and manipulate it. Okay. So, at the same time we did that, I branched out in this totally new direction uh, of uh, these icosahedral protein assemblies. The, the lab has exploded in this area. So the reason I find these interesting is, like I said, bacteria don't, aren't known for having a lot of organization, and yet we thought that would be really important for all the metabolic engineering efforts that have been made, uh, especially in the past decade, to make all sorts of chemicals. People take their um, pathway design, so they come up with some product they want to make, they know which precursor they want to start with, let's say glucose and butanol, just to keep it really simple, and they look through and assemble a bunch of different enzymes, often from very different organisms that will have the best activities to kind of string together and then pop in a bacteria like E. coli or a yeast, such as Saccharomyces, right? So that's the general scheme. They put them together, it either works or it doesn't, and then they start tuning the levels of each enzyme, the levels of the overall pathway that are present in the cell. Sometimes one of the enzymes you chose doesn't work so well, so you go and run a panel of five others. Um, we looked at that and said maybe they just need to be organized because in the native systems that all the enzymes are coming from the same place and evolve together, they probably have more organization than what we're aware of, so maybe we can sort of uh, engineer that into the system by putting organelles in place. So we got really interested in these nanoscale protein compartments that already exist in some enteric bacteria as well as in carbon fixation 
Um, so the carboxysome is responsible for carbon fixation in cyanobacteria. It houses rubisco, so it's like the most abundant organelle on the planet, and yet we didn't really study it until about 20 years ago. Um, so all these fascinating systems to look into, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, once we started looking into them, we realized there's more applications than just the organelles. We can also look at these containers for applications in drug delivery and um, for the production of polymers in very defined patterns, um, nanoparticle growth, single molecule studies, all sorts of things. So uh, we started exploring all of these. Um, and this comes from benefits because you're controlling diffusion in and out. You're sequestering your reactive materials, which may or may not be sensitive, and you can change the local environment. So there's just a lot of benefits to having a reactor within your factory to kind of house the reaction you care about most. So like I said, we, we first conceived of this because we were so interested in sort of compartmentalizing the metabolic pathways of interest. Um, we, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. So we have so much work that I can't, <laughs> I couldn't even get it into like a succinct two slide format. So we worked with bacterial microcompartments that are naturally found in salmonella, because those, that's our bug of choice. Um, and they have two different systems, which is kind of cool, so there's a lot that we can look at there. We figured out how the um, permeability of the shell has pores in it, how that might affect the reactions going on inside. Um, we figured out how to get heterologous enzymes inside, heterologous proteins like GFP as well. So like what's the important coding sequence to put, you can put on the NRC terminus, it turns out if you have an enzyme you want to encapsulate, you can talk to us, there's a lot of things we can do. Um, and then how does this assembly actually come together, and that's something that we're still working on, we have a lot of work to do. So we did this for the salmonella compartments, um, but also at the same time, one of the students in my lab, so Jeff, who has since moved on to Stanford for his postdoc, um, thought it would be really great to use a virus capsid instead of the bacterial microcompartments as the, a model system to kind of explore all these questions. So he developed the MS2 bacteriophage because it infects E. coli, again, very uh, uncommon sense choice. And we figured out how to get enzymes inside of it and how it was um, permeable to small molecules and how its structure um, was determined by its protein sequence. And so, um, anyway, there's a lot of people that have been on these projects and a lot of work being done. Only today, um, Chris in my lab has been doing modeling to kind of prove that these really do have benefits for the pathways, which were our initial target. And he's shown, at least in the model that we have, that it's as beneficial, at least, as a hundredfold increase in the number of enzymes in the pathway if I'm restating your results correctly. And it also helps sequester if you have a toxic product. Um, and it does much better than just engineering the KM by a few folks. So um, it really can work. You don't need as many of them to get the same effect as like, overexpressing a bunch of enzymes, which can be really disruptive. Um, and we are setting out to prove that now. So a lot of the future projects will be in that direction. OK, so I only have two minutes, <laughs> as I see here. So I'll talk really briefly about type 3 secretion. Um, this is something that I covered in detail a couple of years ago and at the seed conference for all those that went. So I, that's why I put it last in case I ran out of time. Um, with this uh, secretion system, as I mentioned earlier, it actually pumps things all the way out of the cell, which is really great for making things like um, antibodies, which are uh, <coughs> a huge target for pharmaceuticals, as well as biomaterials, which tend to do things like polymerizing inside the cell, which isn't good. And all we have to do is increase the titer. We have modified regulation. We have modified the secretion apparatus itself. Um, we have added components to the media. We have explored whether the proteins are still folded and not truncated and how pure they can be. Again, a kind of huge body of work. And this is just showing, first of all, that we can get a lot more protein than we used to get when we first Started, and this is the only way to get them both in the same gel to show you. So I know that it's a horrible block, but that's kind of the design. Um, and it is much purer. After one pass, you get almost 100% purity when you make it this way, kind of akin to the cell-free systems. This is a way to do it if you do want to work in vivo and then secrete. Um, and we've also been more creative with this uh, as well. So we can use the needle um, to be a template for nanowire production. We're thinking about turning it into some sort of bioelectricity application in the future. And I forgot to put it on here. I was going to put um, a NASA 
coated rubber duck, because there's an image of one of those, and I have them in my office. We are also interested in sending salmonella into space. We have a pathway to doing so to see um, what, so we know that in space they're more pathogenic. We don't know why, and we work with this pathogenic system. In fact, it's the first step of that whole process, so we may be able to get some clues into why it's so much harder to treat bacterial infections in space. Um, so that's another potential upcoming project. Okay, so I'm not going to go through a summary. This is my full group photo minus Taylor because she was at Northwestern at the time. This is taken, but everybody else is in it. Oh, awesome, Douglas Leading is not in this photo now. Um, and there's tons of people. I don't even think I have bolded all the right people. Everybody should be bolded. We've had lots of collaborators. Funding is very important, but that wasn't the point of this talk <laughs> to share. So um, I can take questions, but I think that there's no time to come a minute over. So I will hand it over to Julius. Thank you.